So I think I think everybody's um, pretty much in now. So I think I'm going to start. Um, welcome everyone to this evening's Mansfield College um, public talk. Um, I'm Helen Mountfield. I'm the principal at Mansfield College, and I'm delighted uh, this evening to be able to welcome our speaker, um, Professor Sir John Bell. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, John is. Um, known to almost anyone who opens a newspaper or listens to the radio at the moment, but he's always so very well known uh, in Oxford as our Regis Professor um, of Medicine. And he has a very long and illustrious um, CV in terms of um, both medical technological development and uh, public health policy. He was the president of the Academy of Medical Sciences from 2006 to 2011. Um, he's uh, been uh, an, an active contributor to our understanding of immune activation in a range of autoimmune diseases. Uh, he founded the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics. He's been a non-executive director of Roach Holdings and um, also um, chairs both the Gates Foundation um, Global Health Advisory Board and um, the Roach Trust. Um, and in August 2017, he wrote the UK Life Sciences um, Industrial Strategy. Um, the reason that he's here um, this evening is because he's been a leading light in uh, this university's and uh, the world's search to um, help us overcome the terrible COVID um, pandemic. And he is, um, he's been instrumental in the rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, but he's also um, a member of the G7 pandemic task force. And so uh, in an optimistic moment at the beginning of term, I asked John if he would speak to us about after COVID um, and how um, we can think about the development of this pandemic, but with a view to being prepared to um, avoid the worst consequences of what inevitably we will be future ones. So John will be speaking to us for um, about half an hour or 40 minutes. If you want to ask him questions, please do. If you're listening to this um, live, um, you can put the questions in the Q&A box and I will try to get through as many as I can. So just put them in whenever you want to. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much, John. And um, off you go. Helen, thanks so much, and thanks so much for having me. I, I, I wish I was at the college with you, but we're not, so we'll do the best as we can. And I, I thought what the audience might be interested in hearing about is what's sort of gone on in the last 12 months. You're all pretty aware that it's been a pretty brutal 12 months, uh, but I think it's fair to say that we're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. I, I was I was asked a spontaneous question in about November about whether we would be returning to normal by the spring. And it was just at the time where I thought the vaccines were gonna come home. So I rather in, enthusiastically said, yes, yes, yes. And that's been cited by literally thousands of people. Um, and so I've been pretty anxious to make sure we got vaguely back to normal by the spring. Otherwise I was gonna look pretty stupid. And it looks like my prediction is likely to be pretty close to being right, at least for the UK. It really depends whether you view it as being British spring or Canadian spring. Certain, we're certainly gonna make Canadian spring, I think. Um, so look, it's been, a, it's been a pretty busy year and it's been pretty hard on a lot of people, but it's been a, from a biomedical science perspective and from somebody who works in this field, it's been a remarkable experience partly because you can spend your whole career in medicine and never see uh, a health crisis as big as this one, nor have an opportunity to peel back the layers of a brand new disease. So when this virus arrived, no one had ever seen it before. Uh, indeed, uh, it was a brand new form of a virus uh, that hadn't been described before. We knew a little bit about SARS-1, SARS-CoV-1, but we didn't really know about this virus. And, and over the course of the last year, we've been peeling back the layers and every time um, something happens, we learn more and more about the virus. So we've learned a lot about infectious disease. How do you manage it? How do you diagnose it? How do you control it? And it's been a, an exercise of learning as you're running along because you couldn't really wait and do the studies in an orderly and coordinated fashion, fashion, you had to really do them as, as we were moving. Now, what, one thing that I'll, I'll have to say is, um, I, and many people have commented on this, is why has Oxford done so well in this pandemic? And I think it's probably worth just um, 
saying that this is an area of biomedical research with which the university does better probably than anybody in the world. And I think it's true that for those who read the newspapers, there's no university who's achieved what we have during the course of the pandemic. But the roots, and, and in many ways, the foundations of that were set by my predecessor uh, 35 years ago, because we became very interested in global causes of disease and morbidity, not just the things that kill us here in the UK. And as a result, we became very interested in emerging infections and the infections that were largely killing people in the developing world, but any one of which could have rolled across the planet. And as a result, we've had groups in units in Southeast Asia, Africa, all over the world thinking about this problem. And we have a terrific academic strength in emerging infections. The, 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 the lead for the avian flu epidemic that occurred in 2004, 2005 was Jeremy Farah, who now heads the Wellcome Trust, but ran our unit in Vietnam and did a terrific job doing all the fundamental research. Peter Horby, who's been running our big trial, the uh, recovery trial, is actually the professor of emerging infections. This is what he does. He isn't the, you know, he doesn't do cancer research. He doesn't do heart disease research. He works on emerging infections. So when I first got an indication there was trouble, and I got that from two sources. One, George Gao, who's currently the head of China CDC and um, uh, was a student of mine and a postdoc of mine, worked in my lab for uh, almost 10 years. Um, uh, and he was, of course, at the front end of the Wuhan epidemic and was actually initially blamed for the Wuhan epidemic. And I, I was worried that he would be in trouble. But in fact, he's handled it unbelievably well and is now a bit of a hero in China for the work that he's done. And and Jeremy Farrer, of course, who was also in very close touch with what was going on in the developing world. So over Christmas 2019, I was getting messages saying um, trouble coming in China. And uh, just be careful because it's definitely going to be a pandemic. Um, and George, it was George's lab that sequenced the virus for the first time. And the virus sequence arrived, I think, on the 8th of January 2020. And from that... That, that was the sentinel moment for the Oxford team to get moving. But interestingly, it took the country another two months to wake up to the fact that there was actually a pandemic coming. And that's, that's a story that, that is complicated and, and hard to tell. But the reality is no Western country was really well, very well prepared for this when it arrived. But the Oxford program, by the third week of January, when Richard Cornell, who runs the Department of Medicine, brought us all together. We had about 250 people working on different aspects of the pandemic. That's vaccine development, testing, uh, measurement of antibodies, immunology, developing large scale studies. I mean, it was amazing. So, so we've, uh, if I may say so, I think we've had a pretty good pandemic, although I don't think anybody's really had a good pandemic, but you know, if you were fighting a war, we would be, I think in, in, the, in the front ranks of what has happened. So it, it, uh, it all really began in January. And it was at that point that Sarah Gilbert in the, in the Jenner Institute started to develop her vaccine, which is now famous. And I'll come back and talk to, that, talk to you about that because it's one of our great achievements. Um, but there was clearly a, an, a, an ability to get ourselves prepared to do a lot of things during the pandemic. And over the course of the last year, we've learned an enormous amount about the virus and we've learned an enormous amount about how you manage yourself during a pandemic to uh, do the, to, to have the least damage occur that you can possibly do. And just to be crystal clear, it hasn't all worked. And the reason it hasn't all worked is because no one has done this before. And, and, and I think it's, I often draw the analogy to a being, attacked in a war, if, if you were attacked in a war, you would immediately turn to the heads of the Army, Navy, and the Air Force and say, go sort it out, and they would go sort it out. You get attacked by a pandemic, and there really isn't anybody standing there who's got that kind of oversight and responsibility to run it. So, so there's been a, a, an organizational issue about how we made decisions, and also a you know, broader management issue about how do you get stuff done 
not all of which is going to be perfect. And how do you identify the things that are not working in time to make a difference? And I, I'm going to give you some examples of things that have worked really well. Amongst the best were the development of the lateral flow tests, which I led out of Port and Down, and the vaccine task force led by Kate Bingham, who of course is an alumnus of this university, and who did a terrific job getting the UK in a unique place in terms of vaccines. So there are some things which have been really eye-wateringly good and some things which have been less good. So it, it, what do we know and what do we don't know based on the experience of the last year? Well, one thing we know for sure, and I've already said this, is that it's not good to be totally unprepared for a pandemic because there are certain things you can't do in a hurry. And if you don't have preparations done months and years beforehand, you are definitely going to be in trouble. And that was the case with all Western countries. And it's really a failure of the investment in public health as a problem. And public health in the UK has always had a very rich and fine tradition. But the reality is, if you're trying to find things to fund, it's very difficult for people to put money into something that may never happen in the next 10 years or may never happen at all. And as a result, there's a tendency to say, well, let's improve cancer services or let's put more hips into people with sore hips rather than invest in stuff which is longer term and um, uh, less certain to occur. So the, I think there was a, a failure to commit to public health in a way that I think has now proved to be a pretty fundamental mistake. And I think the amount of money you would have had to spend to sustain public health has now been washed away by the flood of costs that we've had by not being properly prepared for the pandemic. Um, having said that, once it was clear that the pandemic was here, I think politicians and senior people, particularly in the Department of Health and Social Care, have performed pretty well to fix the problems which were the result of a lack of resilience in a healthcare system that was already vastly overstretched. So as you know, hospital occupancy was about 95 to 98 percent at the time the pandemic hit. Well, how's that going to work? You know, that was just a, that was a disaster waiting to happen. But in addition, things like testing capacity, which was largely embedded in small testing labs in hospitals, 160 of them around the country. It was all very small, very low key. And they were doing on average about 5,000, five to 6,000 tests a day for COVID when it first arrived. And what, we, what rapidly emerged was that you needed, well, at the moment, just to be clear, we're doing 800,000 tests a day. So actually that's, that was the difference. And you cannot migrate labs that are, a set of labs that do 5,000 tests a day to a lab that does 800,000 tests a day without a dramatic change. And so that was a good example of something that happened over the first few months. And you can remember all of you how frustrating it was that people couldn't get tested. We didn't know who had the disease. We also didn't know really fundamental things about the pathogen. So when we finally emerged with an understanding that at least half the people with this disease were completely asymptomatic, that caught everybody completely by surprise. Well, you, you manage an epidemic very differently if you know that half the people will never have a symptom because that you can't identify who's got the disease. And as a result, the spread of the disease is massive. So we, the, all that had to happen in a relatively short period of time. I was pretty closely involved with the setting up of the lighthouse labs. That was done by a small group of us who met in number 10 in, I guess, the first week of March. And it was clear that we were not going to gain traction trying to expand testing capacity in hospitals. They were already working extremely hard uh, and probably couldn't have done more. So we decided that what we needed was some big central labs. And because I had written the life sciences industrial strategy, I was able to link us in with some of the companies who could provide tests at scale, the best of which was Thermo Fisher. And they stepped up to say they would provide us with large scale testing. And we then had to get the machines to do it. So we, we wrote immediately to all the universities and said, we need your machines. The universities said, off you go. 
we sent the army around to pick up the machines. And a week later, we had three big labs operational across the country and then scaled those over the course of the next uh, six weeks to two months. So we were getting about 100,000 tests uh, a day, which was our first goal. But that gave you an idea of the kind of issues and how quickly everyone had to move and change the way you thought about how you worked. Now, there were a number of other good examples of that. One was that we didn't really know who had the disease and we didn't know how many people had it, how it was regionally distributed, whether it was old people, young people, middle-aged people, people of ethnic groups, who, who all we knew was who was coming into the hospital. And to be clear, by the end of March, that number was pretty big, but it was only the people at the severe end of the disease. So we, uh, in, in a pretty short period of time, we got a hold of Ian Diamond, who runs the Office for National Statistics. And he created a thing called the ONS survey, which you'll see cited every week in the newspapers as the main tool by which we've known what was going on. And I remember I picked up the phone to Ian one day and I said, look, Ian, we're gonna really need you. You've got to set up this study. And can you do it to give us a representative population, age, sex, ethnic diversity, occupational group, geographic location, all the rest of it. And within about two weeks, he'd set up a whole program. Tamsin Berry, who was working with me at the time as a, senior, as a civil servant, took it all on. And a month later, we had a, we had a, a program to work out who had the disease and how do we have it. And it's, it's still in Western countries, by far the best example of large scale epidemiology. And the person who really did the work to set it up was Sarah Walker, who's based here in Oxford in the Department of Medicine. She's an outstanding statistician. And it was she who did all the heavy lifting to get it going. And it was she who every week analyzes all the data and provides it for the team. So it's another example of how things have gone well. Now, the other thing which has been hard is that you may have spotted this because I think most people have spotted it. And that is we've got lots of modelers, but we haven't been very good at predicting how this disease has progressed. And I think it reveals how hard it is to model unless you have really good data to model with. And until the ONS survey and the REACT study and a few others were really going, nobody had the data. And as a result, it was actually very difficult for policymakers to make decisions based on good data because there was no good data. And uh, as you know, we sort of missed the first wave because it had arrived and, and we hadn't really locked down at the beginning of the first wave. And we waited, I think, a bit too long to lock down in that. Uh, although based on the data they had, I can completely understand why it was. But it's been very difficult to trace and track this disease globally. So it would also be nice to know who else was gonna get it. When was Brazil gonna come up? What was gonna happen in South Africa? What about America? They were bound to do well because they throw so much money at healthcare. None of other predictions have worked. America, of course, has been a complete road crash, as everybody knows, despite all the resources they've thrown at it. The diseases migrated randomly around America, totally unpredictably. But it's still a big problem is predicting. Of course, predicting the most current wave, we sort of thought it would happen beginning of January, and we weren't far off because of the release of the lockdown over Christmas. But the wave before that, in the autumn, again, we should have spotted it happening a bit sooner, I suspect, and it, 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 we delayed the lockdown a bit in those circumstances. But if you look internationally, you can see why, because this disease is coming and going in really very odd ways. So I'll give you a couple of examples. The, if you look at India, at the beginning of this, everybody thought India was gonna be the road crash of all road crashes, the most susceptible ethnic group, lots of comorbidities, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, lots of people living really close together and no real public health system to manage it. They had a little flare at the beginning that looked like it was gonna be bad, but the truth is there is no massive problem with this disease in India, even to this day, and no one can explain that. Similarly, Vietnam, Thailand, Southeast Asia, sitting right on the border, Wuhan is only a thousand miles north of them in China, sitting right on the border, pretty dense urban populations. They have never had a problem. And that, look, they do some lockdown stuff and all the rest of it, but I don't believe that the, 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 um, the sort of lockdown strategies of these countries are the explanation why they've done so well. 
Germany, of course, did well very early on. Everybody said, oh, the Germans, they're all so clever. And then, of course, they got swacked with the last wave. And, you know, they were in the same position as everybody else. And in South Africa, the disease is coming and going literally within weeks. It gets to a peak and then it just disappears. And then it reappears a couple of months later. So if you wonder what's going on, no one knows what's going on. I promise you, no one has any idea. And I suspect some of this may be well due to the genetic variants that we're now familiar with. Because of course, in the early stages of the disease, no one was sequencing the variants. And now we are, and we're starting to realize that they're pretty common and they change the characteristics of the disease quite profoundly. And it may well be that there are populations with very significant levels of existing immunity, which means that they're not going to get too severe a disease. So I think those, all those things are features which we're still learning about. And, and please don't blame the model, models if they don't get it exactly right, because this is a very clever little disease. And it's smarter than us in many ways, and there's lots of stuff we don't know about it. So, so that's been one of the issues. Uh, the things we have delivered well, though, not just PCR testing, but mass testing, I can talk a little bit about that later. We set up here in Oxford, the recovery trial, which was collecting all patients who were being admitted to NHS hospitals. And that trial is so much better than anybody else's trial on the planet. No one can believe it. So, you know, there are the Americans with 400 million people and they spend 35 billion a year on their health research. And they are, you know, they are so far behind the recovery trial in producing useful data. It's just unbelievable. Uh, similarly, there's nothing else in Europe that looks like it. So um, that's run by Peter Horbury and Martin Landry, but they've discovered, of course, the first drug which eliminated or reduced death in seriously ill people, which was dexamethasone, came out of the recovery trial. That was a major step forward because it reduced the mortality by about 30%. And the most recent calculation I've seen is that that discovery alone has probably saved about a million lives. So that, I mean, you don't often get to do a trial that saves a million lives in the first year. Um, they also showed that hydroxychloroquine didn't work, work, azithromycin didn't work. All the things that everybody said would work, didn't work. And the things that people were skeptical of, like dexamethasone, turned out to be good. And um, most recently, their work on um, toclizumab, which is uh, an IL-6 receptor antagonist, again, reduces the mortality by another 15%. So if you add it all up, they are having a very big, big impact on the fact that the mortality for this disease on a, on a case fatality rate is actually much less than it would be if we didn't have those therapeutics. So th those have all been great. The other thing which has been terrific, I have to say, is the kind of national, the national support for the biomedical programs that have been leading to these discoveries. So we don't have any trouble recruiting people to trials. In fact, one of the problems we have is we have too many people trying to get into trials. And Kate Bingham for the vaccine study set up a system whereby you could sign up to be a trial participant for any one of a dozen vaccines. And I think we've currently got a database of about 420,000 people, all of whom are waiting to be called to, par to participate in a trial. So the, 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 the national effort has been stunningly good, as has the willingness of the British public to deal with the lockdowns and the trouble and you know, this has not been a happy scene. Terrible for students, terrible for kids in schools, terrible for university students. And yet everybody seems to have put up with it in a pretty reasonable way. And that's made it all a lot easier. One of the reasons the initial lockdown was slow is everybody was worried as that the population would abreact to being locked down. But in fact, everybody behaved really well in the first lockdown, the second lockdown, and hopefully this will be our third and final lockdown. So everybody's made an effort. So let me tell you a little bit about the vaccine because if there are two things that are gonna get us out of trouble, it's the vaccine and the mass testing using lateral flow tests. So the, the journey for the vaccine started with Sarah Gilbert on the 8th of January and a hundred days later, that vaccine was ready to go into man. It's an adenovirus vaccine. Adrian Hill, who built up the Jenner, is really responsible for a lot of the infrastructure that allowed that to happen so well. 
And Andy Pollard, who leads our clinical trials, has done an unbelievable job of rolling out a trial for which we actually had no commercial sponsorship in the first instance. He did that all on his own. And then AstraZeneca finally stepped in to help us. So there's a long and complicated story about how we got together with AstraZeneca, but I have to say we're really pleased to have found them as a partner. And one of the reasons that we did the deal with AstraZeneca and, and, and I sort of led the negotiations on the university side was because they agreed with the two red lines, as it were, that the academics who developed the vaccine here actually had. And that was, first of all, no one here wanted to be seen, particularly in the first year of the pandemic, to be making money out of a vaccine. Um, it was seen to be, a, you know, this was a human crisis that uh, everybody recognized was going to be a real problem. And to be profiteering out of that was seen to be a really bad form. Now, I'm sorry to say that not all pharma companies have taken that view during the course of this, but AstraZeneca very much have. And I think, and so is Johnson & Johnson, I have to say. And boy, do they deserve credit for that because, you know, they've got shareholders who are expecting to get returns on investment. And everybody stood back and said, let's just do the best we can. So that was number one. And the, number, the second thing that AstraZeneca agreed to do, which again, not many pharma companies would do, is that we, we had intended this program in vaccines to be developing vaccines for the global health program, for the developing world not for Western countries. And we wouldn't really want to go forward unless our partner was willing to lean into getting huge scale manufacturing and delivery of vaccine to the developing world. Now there are a whole set of manufacturing issues that I can talk about later, but the reality is AstraZeneca has done that better than anybody else. They've got commitments from 13 manufacturing sites all over the world, Thailand, India, um, Japan, Europe, UK, America, there's 13 different sites and with the capacity of producing three and a half billion doses of this vaccine. So this, because it's very cheap, it's very transportable, uh, four degree cold chain. Um, and because it's not for profit, it's, you know, it's about four or five bucks a dose, I think it's, you know, it's like a, it's like a coffee at Starbucks. Um, it, it really is it's got this fantastic deployability that is going to be absolutely essential if we're going to try and vaccinate everybody in the developing world who needs it, which is really the, the populations who are at most risk of dying from the disease. So it, it has become the vaccine for the world and will, I think, continue to be so. I, I won't talk at length about the relative efficacy of the vaccine compared to others. There's lots of things, mostly nonsense in the newspapers about it. The truth is all these vaccines are broadly the same. Um, uh, uh, this vaccine is almost identical, I have to say, to the J&J &J vaccine, which has been recently announced. Our efficacy data is a bit better, but we give two doses, they give one. Um, and it's actually not a million miles from Pfizer or Moderna. They're all about the same. And the good news about it is they all prevent serious disease and death. And that's actually what you want out of a vaccine. Uh, and they all have other attributes which are good or bad or whatever. But on the whole, these vaccines are all a terrific result. And I think what's exciting as a biomedical scientist is that many of these vaccines come from new platforms. These are not platforms people have ever used or rolled out at scale. The, the Chadox vaccine in Oxford, developed by Adrian, it's a chimp adenovirus, never used in anger before. It's been an amazing uh, vector to use in this set of circumstances. The mRNA vaccines are very, very exciting. But there's also, uh, what people don't know is there's a whole second wave of vaccines which are coming down the line, which are gonna be even more exciting and more potent and more able to deal with the disease. And there are also completely new platforms, viral-like protein platforms and other um, uh, inactivated virus platforms and the likes. So I, I'm very, very upbeat about the impact that these vaccines are gonna have. And that's gonna roll over into the, the next era. And, and of course, the great news is that because of Kate Bingham and the Vaccine Task Force, they really did get it right in terms of buying a ton of vaccines, taking no chances. And the NHS, to their credit, have been unbelievably good at rolling out these vaccines. And we are 
miles at, I think only Israel and the UAE are ahead of us. And they're, you know, don't forget they're tiny countries. So we, you know, our, our ability to vaccinate people at scale is really second to none. And that's going to have an impact on us getting back to normal uh, as soon as spring, because, you know, the more people who are vulnerable who get vaccinated, the more protected they are against disease, the easier it will be to go back to normal life. And I think my, my overall view of that is we will be starting to see significant light at the end of the tunnel very soon. We'll see data from the trials quite soon real world data and will continue to vaccinate and they're vaccinating at real pace. I know they say it'll take them until September to get there, but you know, they may be able to go faster. The supply I think is pretty good from AstraZeneca at the moment. So, so I guess, Helen, what I'd like just to stop on is what do we do to avoid this happening the next time? Because I think that's really the central question. And it's something that a lot of us have been thinking quite hard about. Um, there is a move and as you know, the UK is, is now has the chairmanship of the G7 this year. And I know Boris is very keen to use this as a major focus for the G7 meeting, which is going to take place in June. Uh, there will be a, uh, uh, be a biomedical uh, health minister's G7 take place in Oxford at the same time the main um, uh, uh, presidents and prime ministers are meeting in Cornwall. And, and we will, over that time, be discussing how we can get much better prepared for the next wave of disease. But there are a set of things that we've got to have in place that we didn't have in place this time. And it's just worth running through, through them. One is much better surveillance. You know, it, it wasn't good enough relying on people ringing me up saying, I think this thing is a pneumonia. It could be coronavirus. It might be flu. We don't know. Uh, I mean, you've got to be better than that. And the sooner you know what the, the, the pathogen is, the sooner you can jump in and respond to it. And of course, this is now an active discussion because tracking the new genetic variants is also going to be important. So there are discussions going on about how we get a global network of sequencing capabilities that feed back to a common cloud-based environment so that we know which diseases are circulating where. And that should also help us with some of the modeling issues. So that, that is a key issue, but so is the issue of having more common data standards between countries. I mean, it was, as a global effort, I think this thing gets a, it gets a failing grade, frankly, because, you know, countries have, they've been rather good at fighting with each other, but not very good at working with each other, frankly. And the data standards in each country is separate and different. So you can't compare death rates, incidence rates, testing rates. You can't compare anything from country to country. So you can't really tell what's going on with this. So we've got to get to a position where we've got common data standards. And we also should share in the ability to recruit to trials together. Because you know, if you'd done recovery across the whole of Europe, you would have been generating a data, a data, a data result every two weeks. It would have been amazing. So we do have to get much better at that. Uh, and I think everybody uh, can help. And then there is also um, the issue about how do we move quicker to develop vaccines and how do we set ourselves up so the vaccines where possible are all on the shelves and that we have better, better antiviral drugs that are already developed that you can use. And so there are, not, there are really only two pathogens that we need to worry about in the short term uh, and those are coronaviruses and flu. But just to tell you, I mean this, if people think that I'm fussing, because I think some people do think I'm fussing, I just want you all to do this thought experiment. The first SARS epidemic, SARS-CoV-1, carried a mortality of 35%. That means one in three people who got the virus died. So just play that out with the current pandemic and say, well, actually we've got a mortality of about 0.8%. That's gonna be 35%. I can tell you the world as we know it would come to a complete grinding halt. And the avian flu epidemic, well, it wasn't really an epidemic, but the outbreak in Vietnam that Jeremy looked after, the case fatality rate was 50%. Half the people who got it died. So, you know, this is not, I'm not joking here. This is actually much more serious. And given the amount of money we plow into our defense, conventional defense forces and those nuclear submarines we've got padding around the North Sea, I think we've got to think quite hard about how we treat pandemics in a similar way. 
because they could have just as devastating effect on the UK population. So we've got to manufacture antivirals to develop and manufacture them. We've got to have better vaccines. We've got to prepare diagnostics so they're already in advance. We've got to have a network for manufacturing so that we don't run into this manufacturing crisis, which we've had in the last pandemic. And mostly, we've got to get global political will to work with each other so that we do genuinely see this as a global problem. I can completely understand why countries want to be, have their own people vaccinated first, but they do have to keep their eye on the needs of the developing countries and the LMICs, low and middle income countries, where they don't have the capacity to make vaccines. And we do need to be make sure we're generous in ensuring that we're making vaccines that flow over into those. And as you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine is by far the biggest vaccine in the COVAX program. It's being contributed by most people and by most of the countries involved and will be the, will be the, will be the anchor for the global pandemic response. So look, I've probably talked too long, that's 40 minutes. Can I, I think I'll just stop there. I'm sure people will have the odd question, which I'm very happy to answer, but it's been a bit of a saga, but I think we're almost there now. You. Talking about learning lessons from the future, you would have thought I'd learned to unmute by now. Anyway, I'm unmuted now. So thank you very much, John. Um, I really appreciate that. It's very interesting to hear some of those forward looking thoughts and also um, the uh, really interesting um, you know, technical solutions that are being um, advanced at the moment. Um, and also some of the global governance issues that arise. Um, there are um, some questions already. Obviously, they come from a lot of different angles. So I'm going to try and um, um, and get through um, what I can. So starting with um, uh, better surveillance in the first place, um, one of the questions that I've been asked, which is about this country, I think, is what the medical establishment was telling the government in December 2019 and 2020 when they were telling them and um, when 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 the government responded to that, you, you said we were a little bit slow off the blocks. Was that because of failure to respond to the information that the medical profession was bringing, or because of concern about um, other consequences of, of lockdown? Yeah, so it it was it's a complicated story because, in fairness, it, you know, since twenty it's, since the year two thousand, we've had eight potential pandemics. So we had the two SARS outbreaks in Asia, one in South Korea, one in Hong Kong, that petered out for, for reasons that we don't understand, but didn't create a pandemic. We had the two avian flu um, uh, outbreaks, which weren't really out, but there were more outbreaks for chickens than there were for humans, but there were a number of humans who died, but there was always a worry that that would roll up. And then of course we had the swine flu pandemic of 2013, 2014. We had Zika in particularly in South America. We had Ebola in Africa. So, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of close calls, but interestingly, none of them have actually exploded on us into, into a global acute pandemic. And I think because of that, there was a view that this might well end up in the same place as those other um, outbreaks. And, and of course, that was proved not to be the case. But you can see, based on the history in recent years, why people might have said, well, actually, is it really going to be a threat? But I think had they known what was at the back end of it, had it really arrived, they probably would have moved a bit faster. But you can see the conundrum people had in terms of making a decision. And, and to be clear, it wasn't really until the disease got to Italy there, of course, there was a few cruise ships. We didn't know anything about asymptomatic spread. We knew China was a mess, but the Chinese, of course, were understating their, the impact of the disease, which we kind of knew, but you know, there's nothing you can do about it. And it, it, it wasn't obvious what was happening until it got to Italy. And then when it got to Italy and Spain, it was clear that this was a problem. Um, but I, I think it was hard for everybody to realize what was really gonna happen. And I think that's why it was slow. And I, I think it's, to be honest, a bit of lack of experience, but also the precedent of other, of other pandemics that didn't turn out to be pandemics. Yeah. But I think that's why we have to resolve never to let that happen again. It's quite an important yeah. feature. 
I mean, it's, somebody's asked, you've, you've outlined a lot of the things that went right in this country, not least in this university, but somebody's pointed out that we probably have the highest death rate in the world, which is quite interesting in a, in a country with, um, you know, universal health provision and a relatively developed country. I mean, do you have any idea why that might be? Yeah, so I, I think this gets back to this interesting question about why this disease behaves very differently in different geographies. And I, and I don't think that's entirely the fault of the geography. I think it may have to do with the strain of the virus that spreads. Um, it may, it, it almost certainly has something to do with the resilience of the healthcare system because the NHS was stretched from very early on. The admissions to hospital here were very late. People were quite sick by the time they got to hospital. So that may have something to do with it. Um, I also think that we could have done a much better job at preventing the spread of the disease earlier in the UK in certain settings. So in the NHS, there was quite a lot of nosocomial spread in NHS institutions. Um, and that is, it was being spread by, from healthcare workers to patients and from patients to patients. And of course, everybody in the hospital is actually quite vulnerable. So that would obviously add to trouble. And then the care home problem, which again, we were slow to start testing people going to care homes from hospitals. Again, partly because there was no realization that, you know, some people leaving hospitals who had no symptoms were actually carrying the disease. And of course, as soon as you have an outbreak in a care home, boy, that'll do wonders for your death rate, I can tell you. So, so th I think those are all things that were not optimal. I, and I, you know, it, it's just, a, I think it's fair to be self-critical about those things. But there are also other features of this which are really odd. I mean, I think the Indian thing is really weird. I really don't get that. And I was looking at Rwanda the other day. So Rwanda has had a, a, has had a massive surge in the last three weeks to a month. And we were just thinking about how quickly we could get them vaccine. And then the, the, the pandemic has just disappeared in literally in a week, it's gone. Nobody with disease. Now, who knows what's going on there? So, so I, I, you know, I think we should rightly beat ourselves up for, there are some things which we should have done better. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. But I think we, it's, I'm, I'm not sure we should, we should be too surprised that some countries have done worse than others for reasons that we can't explain. Yeah. So you're talking about an awful lot of unknown unknowns here. Yes. And one of the questions I've been asked is, what is the one piece of information you would have liked to have had in December 2019? I mean, what, if you were trying to work out what you needed to know, you talked about better surveillance. What What is it that would have been really useful to know? Yeah, I, I think that probably the the most important thing would have been to understand what the real prevalence of the disease was, symptomatic and asymptomatic. In other words, if we had had really good testing, so we could say, actually, guys, the, the prevalence of this disease is X, both asymptomatic and symptomatic, then we would have changed a lot of the things we did early in the pandemic and probably saved quite a lot of lives. It took us a while to get to that. And, you know, the problem is everybody was filling in the Zoe app. Well, you know, that's all fine, except it was missing three quarters of people with the bloody disease. So, you know, we were getting all kinds of crazy data coming in and and it was confusing and difficult. So I think if you, that, that would have been the one piece of data that I would have really wished we had. And it wasn't really until we got the first set of ONS data back that it became so clear that we were, we were not, just not counting a lot of people carrying virus in their nose. Yeah. Okay, now I'm, again, I'm trying to group these questions a little bit. There are some okay. questions about uh, vaccines, what we know about vaccines, the efficacy of vaccines. Um, uh, somebody asks whether you, um, when we're likely to know if ac vaccines can stop infections of others. Question yeah, like so, so there, this is a big question about whether the vaccines will actually stop viral replication and stop you from spreading the, the, the I guess this is really about spreading the disease around the community. Um, we, we know they can stop serious disease and there's really only one good data point on asymptomatic or viral replication. To, to be clear, in all the primate studies, they still had virus replicating in their nose after they had the vaccine. So we were always worried that the vaccines wouldn't be able to influence that. But the Oxford data published, I think two to three weeks ago, showed that 
there was about a 67% reduction in asymptomatic replication in people who've had the vaccine. That, that's a stunning result because nobody else has got data like that. It's really, really good. And that means that it'll be very effective at suppressing the R, as it were, in the population because there will be fewer people spreading disease around the population. So I'm pretty optimistic that, that, that many of the vaccines may be able to suppress replication and that could prove to be really helpful. Importantly though, and this is a really important point, people talk about zero COVID. That is a pipe dream. That is not happening. So this is a disease which, 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 which I think will be with us forever. None of the respiratory viruses that we know about, flu, RSV, beta coronaviruses, the ordinary, it, it, there, there's no situation where those have been driven out of existence by anything, either vaccines or controls or whatever. They're always circulating the population. They pop up in winter, they go away in summer. You know, in a bad flu year, people die. There's no doubt that they die, the elderly in particular. Um, and that's gonna be the case with, with COVID-19. You know, it's here forever, but we'll, I think, pretty rapidly get so we can live with it. The population will be largely immune. Uh, it'll come and go and we'll just have to deal with it. And we may have to change the vaccine every so often to deal with the odd variant as we do with flu. But that, so that's, I think it's really important that people don't get their hopes up that suddenly we're gonna squeeze this virus out of the world's population. Mm. That's definitely not happening. So apart from being concerned for individuals who choose not to have the vaccine, who would benefit from it, should we be worried on a population level about anti-vax narratives and people who don't, don't choose to vaccinate? Or is that actually just a problem for the health of those people? Well, it's certainly a problem for the health of those people. And, and you know, if they, I know they may be young people, but you only have to see people with this syndrome called long COVID. And there are a number of young people who get this. I can tell you, this is a pretty unpleasant disease. I had a text message yesterday from a colleague who uh, is young in their 40s, I think maybe early 50s, who had COVID in March, and they still are completely disabled by long COVID. And, and you know, this is a fit, healthy person. So, uh, you know, just, you know, before you decline the vaccine, you should think pretty hard. I also think that it will be, it'll be interesting as to how the courts manage the employer who says, well, you're welcome to a job, but the contract says you got to have the vaccine. Now that's, you know, that will be, that'll be an interesting question of civil rights and is it right, is it wrong? But in a sense, it's a public health issue because the employer might say, look, I've got a lot of people working closely together on the shop floor. I can't have somebody spreading virus around there. And as a result, you got to play the game. I think there, you know, it's interesting because we don't have any trouble saying to people with HIV, look, you can have HIV, but if you want to have sex with somebody, you got to wear a condom. And you know, that's the deal. And if you don't, then that is reckless. And as a result, you can be, you can be charged. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I think people are gonna to have to take some responsibility for the implications of where they are as it relates to other people. You're a much better person, Helen, than I to decide what the legal nuances of this are going to be. I wouldn't begin to guess, but it's, I can tell you it's going to be complicated. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it is. It's ethically and, and legally um, yeah. complicated. Yeah. Um, and I know, are we going to have supply problems? Are we going to end up with people who've had a first dose of Pfizer but can't get a second one? Can we mix and match with AstraZeneca? What, what's the yeah, result? so that's a, boy, that's a good question. So we're, we're right into that at the moment. So Matthew Snape in the Department of Pediatrics is doing the studies as we speak, mixing the vaccines. It's what we call heterologous vaccine mixes. So adenovirus, Oxford virus, vaccine, Pfizer vaccine, Pfizer vaccine, Oxford vaccine, Oxford vaccine, Novavax, Oxford vaccine, J&J. &J. And one of the things that we've got a little bit of data on is sometimes that produces much better boosts than you get if you just stay with the same vaccine. So you get a broader and a deeper response. And it may well be a way that we can deal with the variants because your immunity may be much stronger. The, the other thing that we have to be conscious of is that if you use the same vaccine repeatedly, you may get very bad reactivity to it. So you may find that people get really sick when they get the third vaccine. And that, I think that's likely to be particularly true with the 
mRNA vaccines, um, but there's no clear data yet. But that I think will be an issue because that may limit the number of times you can have a vaccine. And as a result, you really want a, you want a, a cupboard full of lots of different vaccines so you can mix and match them. The gap between first vaccine and second vaccine, I know poor old Public Health England got beaten up very badly about that, but the truth is that was all based on data. And when we, as you remember, when we announced the results of the AstraZeneca vaccine at the beginning, we had three different efficacy levels and everybody went, ah, and the Americans couldn't deal with it. So they went and put their head in the sand. But the, as time went on and we got more data, it was very clear that the highest efficacy came from people who had a 12 week gap between the first, a long gap between the first and the second dose. And that, that's now very, very robust data. And it's paralleled by increases in antibodies that, it, that go up every week between four weeks and 12 weeks. So the, the support for that is huge. And in fact, most regulators are now recommending a 12 week gap. That you, your protection from the first dose is about 75% anyway. And uh, then if you push it out, you get up into the mid 80s if you have a long gap between the two vaccines. So, so look, we've been learning as we're going along. I, I, you know, I apologize, it's all seen a bit confusing. It's been confusing to us too, but you know, if, you, if we just kind of stayed with it and generated more data where we could, and that's where we've ended up. Yeah. Okay, um, just in terms of risk assessment, um, actually Man Mansfield's alum, Christian Dubé, hi Christian, um, who's a bit of an expert in rolling out um, health, um, health treatment. And he asks whether the COVID um, the Oxford COVID risk assessment tool um, is likely to be developed for public use, or whether it's only going to be used by clinicians. And obviously yeah, so that's a really interesting question, because when I, 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 mean, I knew it was being developed, and then when it was announced this week, I thought, well, I'm just going to go on the web and find out what my risk is. Anyway, of course, I couldn't find it on the web, because normally you'd be able to type in the bits and find out where you are. I mean, I, I think it would be very reasonable to make it widely available, because, you know, people do, does, do change their behavior based on their risk. And you know, it's pretty interesting to know where you are in the hierarchy. And, you know, it's, it's in fact, it, what's been interesting, as soon as we knew that this disease killed elderly people with comorbidities like hypertension and obesity, and those of certain ethnic groups, those people have sheltered really well. And in fact, they sheltered so well that that's one reason why the Oxford vaccine doesn't have a lot of data in people over 65, is because by the time we got to the second wave, all the people over 65, they were hunkered down and they were not going out and they were not getting disease. So I, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a terrific result, but it, 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 is a, it, it is an interesting observation that people will respond. If they know their risk profile, they will respond. And so I'm hoping it'll become public, but I'm not, I don't make those decisions. It's somebody else who makes those decisions. So. Okay, I mean, I've got some really interesting questions, which maybe we can um, come back to um, if, uh, about, um, the impact of what we know now and the research that's been done on future um, medical and vaccine research. But just in terms of the way that we uh, respond, as you said, the, the political response, um, there are some interesting questions about the risk um, that developing countries may become incubators for new, potentially more infectious strains or even vaccine resistant strains of um, COVID because of delays in vaccinating their populations. And that leads into some of the things that you and I were discussing before um, we went on onto, onto this seminar and other people are asking, which is how do we encourage companies, sorry, countries to overcome their national interests in favor of developing global strategic networks yeah. and how we might go yeah. about that. So, so this is the, I think this is the key question. And um, I think there's a, a very important point and you sort of raised it and that is the more viral replication you have out there the more mutations you're going to get so the, the the higher the disease level you know the level of viral load that people are carrying is just driving the creation of new variants and then they will be selected based on their ability to infect people more efficiently or escape the immune response and, and, and as a result, there's a sort of cauldron out there at the moment of a very, very large amount of virus um, uh, circulating. And that means that there are lots of mutations coming up. And until you suppress that replication broadly, you're gonna keep getting mutations. Interestingly, all the new variants that we've seen so far are probably variants that are not escaping the immune response. They're almost all just 
making the virus better at living in a human. This is a virus that's moved hosts. It's moved from a bat or a pangolin, probably a pangolin actually, into a human. And it's just kind of settling in saying, ah, oh, well, this is a nice new apartment. I'm gonna move the TV over there and set the couch over here. And it's mutating to do that. So these, these increase affinity for the receptor they bind to, they're more infectious. They're not much more pathogenic, but you could get one that was much more pathogenic. So this is, we're playing, we're in an unpredictable period, which I think we need to be able to deal with. And that gets to your point about how do we get people to realize that until we've largely vaccinated and suppressed the R across the world, we're gonna be pretty vulnerable to trouble. And that, that I, I think the problem is, I, it's a very real one and I, 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 it's interesting because I've had this experience both in the UK and in Canada. And, and that is that in both countries, there is a real interest in trying to make sure developing LMICs gets access to the vaccine. But for politicians who were elected by people in those countries, their first responsibility is to make those people are protected. Even if they're protected in advance of people who live in Botswana or Rwanda or wherever. Um, and the politicians, the politicians kind of know that and they acknowledge it and that's what they have to respond to. So that's really where we ended up was the first large amounts of vaccine that were gonna come out of the pipeline in each country were gonna be used for local citizens. And I, I just think the idea that from day one you were gonna be spreading it around the world that, that is, that's not political reality, so forget it. That I don't think will ever happen. You then get to a point though, as the UK will be getting to pretty soon, where actually you've got lots of spare vaccine. And the real question is, how do you use that most appropriately? So, you know, we'll have a large amount of Novavax vaccine. We'll get J&J vaccine very soon. We're gonna get some more Pfizer, AstraZeneca. We're the most productive site for pr production of AstraZeneca vaccine in this country. And they're producing no, literally millions of doses a week. So we're likely to get even more of that. And I think it's gonna be really important to deploy those as quickly to the developing world as we possibly can, particularly to places that we really need it. So we've pushed really hard to get doses to Brazil, for example, where there's a terrible epidemic still running, which is a real problem. We pushed really hard to get doses to Africa, particularly South Africa. Um, we've been very interested, of course, in making sure that India had enough if it needed it. It turns out that they don't need it. But those are, you know, there are a lot of people in this world and we're a long way from having enough vaccines. And that's, that's why I think everybody has to accept that all these vaccines are good. They shouldn't be fussy about which one they've got. They should get on and get as many people vaccinated as possible because that's our best chance of suppressing variants, I think. And what about everyday precautions like masks and social distancing? Are these here pretty permanently or if, if we want to suppress the, vac the, um, the, the virus? Well, I, I, there are two views on this and that's, you know, so, it, it's, yeah. So, so to be clear, there's no data. So, you know, everybody says two meters. Well, you know, if you want the data that proves you've got to be two meters away from the person you're sitting next to, you've got to go back to the 19th century. It's all data generated 150 years ago. I mean, it's, most of the things we do in this pandemic is are not evidence-based. Similarly, masks, I, masks make sense to me. Is there a volume of literature that says that they're really, really effective? No, there isn't. So I, I, I think my view is that, you know, there may be circumstances where we get the masks out again. If we have another outbreak, either of flu or of coronavirus in the winter, we may be a bit more accustomed to masks and we may say, okay, masks, that'll be okay. Everybody put a mask on. But I'm hoping we're going to get back to a position where we do what we do and the background levels of disease will be low. Occasionally, you're going to get um, a sore throat and a cough, just like all our kids do when they go to nursery. They get a beta coronavirus and they come home with a streaming nose. You know, get used to it. That's, that's living synergistically with, uh, with yet another virus. And I think I'm hoping that's where we're going to end up. I hope we don't try and squeeze this thing out completely. Otherwise, we'll, you know, we'll be, we'll have masks on until the cows come home. I think I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't be doing that. 
So I have a question I want to end with, but I'm going to try if I can, if you don't mind, John, to squeeze one in before that, because I don't want to leave out a fundamental area. Um, but one was um, somebody asking about, well, two questions, really. I'm pulling them together. But how is research into how disease is done going to change the result of the a pandemic and particularly somebody asks what role therapeutics and associated research are going to play yeah so it's a really good question so i i i think there is a big risk that people will immediately leave emerging infectious disease as an area of research activity and you have to remember that there's no there's no market there's a market failure for things that work for these sorts of infections because it's very difficult to make money out of something that only appears once every 20 years. And as a result, the commercial R&D play is gonna, is gonna drift very quickly away from infectious diseases. And I think there's a big risk for that. It's a bit like a, a antimicrobial resistance, which we all know is out there, but nobody's working on it because there's no market, because nobody wants to make an antibiotic that only goes into a thousand people a year. So, so there's a, I think governments have a role to play in fixing the market failure and actually providing people with an income if they do good innovative research and, and making that go. And I, I think that's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing for governments to do, but I, I think you do need the industry involved in this because you will not get good antivirals unless you do that. Okay. So that in a sense rolls into these last two questions and it's been put in a slightly negative way by our MCR president, uh, Olivier Melon, then by a slightly more positive way by someone else. So this is the question. Um, Olivier asked whether we can prevent future pandemics, and if not, when we can expect the next one. Um, but someone else has put this in a more positive way, which is to say, who are the players worthwhile, most likely effectively to support global collaboration efforts to prepare for a possible future pandemic, and why? So yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I think the answer is that we're, we're there are a lot of issues that are making these pandemics more frequent. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, the standard statistic that people used is that you get a major infectious disease outbreak about once every 15 years. Um, and you know, there's a long list of them. There've been repeated flu epidemics since uh, 1918. We've had polio, we've had HIV. You know, this, look, infectious diseases are, I know everybody thinks that we fixed it. We haven't fixed it. There are lots of these and we're gonna get more. Um, and we will, because of the changing nature of our sort of social geography, whereby we're chopping down forests, there are a lot of animals living closer to humans, people are eating all kinds of strange and weird delicacies, um, there is going to be more trouble. And I think the high prevalence since 2000 is a really good indication that we're going to get more of these for sure. And so the real question is, can you what can you do to, to shut it down or to slow it down so that you can respond more effectively? Because, you know, the truth is if we'd had an extra three months to get ourselves organized or even six months to get ourselves organized, it, this would have been a, a very different pandemic than it was on this occasion. So I think we do need to get these systems in place so that we can see these things coming and then respond appropriately with well-supported public health efforts to actually just deal with you because we do have a lot of the we do have a lot of the teal tools to respond to them so i so i I'm, I'm i'm optimistic first of all i'm not optimistic that we can ever get rid of pandemics because that is not happening and i and i just I, you will have heard these stories that people have suggested that we should sequence all the pathogens up the back end of a bat and then we'll know what the list is i mean that is completely cloud cuckoo land let me tell you there are a lot of viruses and pathogens on this planet the best thing is to focus on the ones that are really going to cause trouble and, and to, to make a play of that. And there's not that many of those. Mm -hmm. um, the, the real question, I think, is the second question, and that is, who's going to play? Yeah. And, and I think that is a really interesting question. So I think the UK wants to play, and that's all the way from the top. Boris made a speech at the UN three months ago where he laid out his plan to try and tackle this. And he would really like to do something in this space. I think there are other countries that have realized and really taken the hit from this who will want to participate. Um, there are lots of countries that would if they had the resources, but many of them, of course, don't have the resources. So, you know, most countries don't have a strong biomedical research base, so they can't really help. But I suspect 
the majority of country, company, countries will say, well, that was that, it's not gonna happen again. Let's go back to growing GDP. Let's make more cars. Let's chop down more forests. Let's keep going, blah, blah, blah. And I, I think that in the end, that will have consequences, I suspect. So I'm hoping we, ha we have, not everybody has to play, but I think those that do play will probably live to be happy that they've got a better defense mechanism than we had this time. Great. Well, listen, thank you, John, for a really fascinating talk ranging over an enormous uh, range of really important uh, medical and social and um, governance issues, um, plenty of food uh, for thought. Um, and anyone who wants to join us next week, next week's Friday, um, talk at Mansfield at 5.30 will be Miranda Wayland, who is the head of creative diversity at the BBC talking about how to bring more diverse voices into our creative industries. And she will be joined by a relatively recent Mansfield graduate, Serena Arthur, who is um, an editorial uh, publisher with one of um, the UK's biggest publishing houses and was one of the founders of Onyx magazine, which was a, um, a, a magazine in Oxford um, focusing on um, creativity in African and African Caribbean students in Oxford. So um, join us then. If you have someone who you know wanted to make this talk and couldn't, it will be up on uh, YouTube in the next few days with uh, our other Friday talks. And in the meantime, thank you very, very much, John. Um, it was a brilliant talk. Thank you.